Society's Museum of Nebraska History and the February 2004 Brown Bag Lecture. My name is Deb Arns and I'm the Senior Museum Curator for the Historical Society. Today's program is Public Art, A Blessing and a Curse by Suzanne Wise. And Suzanne is the Executive Director of the Nebraska Arts Council. As Executive Director, she's the agency's CEO and represents the Nebraska Arts Council at the state, regional, and national level in a variety of ways. She works with the Nebraska Arts Council to implement agency goals and objectives and responds to the needs of the state's arts community through financial support, services, and advocacy. Suzanne also works with the Nebraska Cultural Endowment in developing financial resources for the arts and humanities. Prior to becoming director, she served the Arts Council staff for 14 years and managed the state's public art program and artist fellowship program in addition to working on special projects. She has a master's degree in art history from the <coughs> University of Kansas and has held curatorial positions at Sheldon Art Gallery in Lincoln, Joslin Art Museum in Omaha, and Northwestern University's Block Gallery in Evanston, Illinois. In addition, she has taught art history at UNL, UNO, and Creighton University. Suzanne has served on the boards of the Lincoln Arts Council, the Mary Ross Film Theater, and the Art Committee of the Lincoln Lancaster County Building, Building Commission. In 1998, she was awarded an, uh, an Outstanding Alumni Achievement Award from the UNL Hickson Lead College of Fine and Performing Arts by the College Alumni Board of Directors. Please join me in welcoming Suzanne Wise. Thanks, Deb. My talk today has one of those kind of weird little titles that, you know, it's just supposed to be provocative, but it's, it's really true. Art in public places, in my opinion, is almost always a blessing. Even if you don't like what you're seeing, it can form the basis for a conversation. But it can also be a curse if you're the person that has been intimately involved in, in placing the work. And a lot of this has to do with the whole process that you go through when you try to put up a, a work of public art. So uh, my lecture today is really going to be initially an overview of uh, the types of public art, because it's pretty broad ranging actually, the functions, that's the kind of feel good part, and then I'd like to give you four case studies of public art uh, where this indeed a blessing and a curse uh, comes into play. So these are the these are the areas that that I'm going to be addressing today. The four main types of public art I think the the most traditional is is the monument. <laughs> Here's one of the most obvious of those. It's the Statue of Liberty. I know when you walked in today uh, you were confronted almost immediately with Lee Lowry's sower even though we don't see the sower on the same eye level as uh, you see when you walked in today. That also is a monument and monuments tend to have a kind of uh, they become almost stereotypical, they have a kind of universality, they, they come to symbolize uh, a nation, symbolize an ideal, and that is uh, one type. Another type is what we refer to as building enhancement, and here's a simple, very local variety of that, and um, I always view the state capitol in total as a work of art and it's full of building enhancements and the nice thing about the Nebraska State Capitol is virtually everywhere you turn either on the exterior or the interior you're going to find these types of enhancement and what's particularly important about the Nebraska State Capitol is it's all been very carefully thought out uh, most of the images even when they're decorative in a way they also have iconographic significance and certainly in the case of a Great Plains state, the buffalo is indeed uh, an iconographic symbol. Here's another example of, of the type of um, building enhancement that is going on today um, in a more contemporary way. This is a um, neon and sound installation that was uh, installed in Albuquerque, New Mexico that connects the plaza with the convention center and uh, it's, it's really more of an environmental piece as opposed to a piece that, that is um, more traditional in terms of like a building relief or something of that nature. 
And we're seeing more and more of this. And interestingly enough, as I go through the slides, I want you to note how many of the examples I'm selecting are from Western states. The West, particularly Arizona and parts of California, have really looked at public art in a very serious way. Most major communities in the Western states have public art commissions and have a very civic um, interest in public art. In the East, of course, it's a really more traditional because the East had, was settled so much uh, earlier than the West, and so public art in the East tends to be like the monument in the plaza. In the Midwest, it's kind of a mixed bag, and I think as I make these remarks today and as you're walking back to your workplace or, or driving home, think about Lincoln and think about where Lincoln kind of stands on this issue, you know. Do we integrate art into the entire civic structure of our community, or, or don't we, or is it kind of a mixed bag? Site enhancement. The piece that we just looked at, in a way, is, is site enhancement, but I'm referring really more to taking an environment in its totality and using art as a way of enhancing that environment. And of course, this piece is in Portland, uh, a variety of pieces that uh, are enhancing a, a park. Uh, we have several examples in Lincoln, if you think about it, and also if you think about the Sheldon Sculpture Garden as site enhancement for the University of Nebraska campus, that's an excellent example as well. And again, when you look at the artwork, think about how it is cited, what that relationship is between the work of art and the environment around it. Here's another very famous example by the artist Jody Pinto. Uh, this was a street, street widening project in Phoenix, and this goes back to my earlier reference about uh, community public art programs. In the city of Phoenix, virtually every public work project has an art component to it. And in this case, uh, there was a rerouting of the street system, and it created uh, an area that they thought would be perfect for enhancement. And as you can see, the artist has created a nice little pocket park and the artist was involved in all aspects of this creation, which goes from the landscaping to the pavement to the benches and its overall design. And then finally we have uh, temporary installations. And I apologize, some of these slides I pulled off of the, uh, the web at the last minute and they're not very clear. I don't think people are, uh, they're familiar with the Chicago cows and certainly we can talk about Tour de Lincoln, but <laughs> This phenomena has been big all over the place. I, I just came back from uh, during the big fish uh, temporary installations that are going to go up in, in Fremont in a couple of months. And uh, because uh, Charles Schultz is originally from St. Paul, uh, St. Paul decided rather than cows they were going to have big Snoopies. So I think uh, like the Tour to Lincoln, it, it really helps you uh, def think about what does this mean and I would argue that even though Snoopy is a, a much loved character um, to enhance Snoopy isn't quite the same mm -hmm. as enhancing perhaps the bicycles I mean I think that there was a, a lot more variety that could be done with the bicycles and I also think that the comment of uh, this really becomes more of a craft project uh, the, the, uh, the object is there the artist is asked to enhance the object as opposed to the artist coming up with the object itself certainly comes into play. But I am the first to cheer on a community to do any sort of, of temporary exhibition. Uh, just the dialogue alone is worth the price of admission. <coughs> so you can see public art can function in a variety of ways and I've just simply listed the, them here because I, I'm not going to really uh, talk about this issue. It makes an area alive. It helps you define the space. Uh, it can be a design solution, such as we saw with the Jody Pinto. It can be uh, economic development. I think that uh, there are a variety of situations where visitors to a community come specifically to be part of the arts experience in that community. 
and I think of public sculpture parks that are, are a destination and I'd like to argue that probably Sheldon falls into that category. Certainly the, uh, the sculpture garden around the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis is another one. Um, Battery Park in, in New York City. Um, Chicago, just walking around the downtown area with your little public art map. It really becomes part of the destination that the visitor does when they come to the community. And finally, the one area that I'm going to really talk about today is art as a community building entity. The art itself can help provide the context for community life and identity. And in a sense, this really has to do with how a community decides what it's going to do with public art. How is the art selected? Well, for eons, I refer to this as the Medici method. Basically, somebody very wealthy or an entity that's very wealthy says, ah, I am going to commission a work, purchase a work, build a building that has lots of uh, decorative elements, and there it sits. Essentially, the input into the Medici method really isn't very deep. It's usually the entity itself and whether or not the individual or the corporation chooses to have help with this uh, sense or not. And the Medici method is certainly alive and well in the United States, and it really is something that you see a lot with corporate structures. And um, you really wish sometimes that the corporate structure really had had some sort of public input or help into what they've, uh, what they've decided to erect in their um, green space or, or what have you, because often it it's can be particularly uninspired and very safe. Um, of course, in past centuries, what was perhaps safe even at that time is now revered as, as something, you know, as part of our cultural or legacy. So, you know, it depends on how you look at this issue, and I think only time will tell in terms of what's being put up today by uh, corporations and by uh, private individuals who uh, elect to have art in a public space. More commonly, it's art by committee. And the committee can either be a committee based solely on arts professionals, or it can be a committee based on a mix of arts professionals and the community. Uh, it can be a mix of arts professionals, bureaucrats in the community. There's a variety of models. In many cases, there is a legislative mandate and as I was referring to uh, the states to the west and the south of us, uh, often the legislative mandate is a city mandate. The city of Phoenix has a public art law. The county that Phoenix resides in also has a public art law, and the state of Arizona has a public art law. In the case of Nebraska, there is a state public art law, but it only relates to buildings that the legislature has provided money for. So that narrows down the uh, public art to state office buildings, uh, buildings on the university campus, or the state college system. So it's a pretty narrow range of legislation. Does the city of Lincoln have a mandated legislative public art law? No. Does the city of Omaha? No. Does any other community in Nebraska have one? No. Often, airport authorities will have legislated public art laws. And as I'm telling you all of this, each one has a little bit different way that they go about doing what they do. This is an area where if you're a bureaucrat and you love facts and figures, you can spend hours browsing through the varieties of public art legislation that exist. Finally, grassroots efforts, and a Tour to Lincoln is a, is a very good example of that. Uh, there was a kind of sense of, hey, we need to do this. There was an identity by the local arts council that we can sponsor this, that acted as kind of the administrative entity, and it was a, a really committed group of citizens and artists that 
suggested that this is what needed to happen. And this is not only true with temporary art exhibitions, but it can certainly be true uh, in other situations as well. I'm currently acting as an advisor to the Quest Center in, in Omaha. Uh, that particular structure did not have a art component. There was a lot of concern on the part of the community that Omaha was making this huge investment in a world-class convention center, but it was going to be rather devoid of any sort of enhancement that helped define it beyond being the building itself. And um, the powers that be kind of listened to that. And so there has now been a process that's been initiated that we hope will place public art, both privately purchased or commissioned, temporary installations, and maybe some other methodology. We're not sure at this point. But that's happening, and that really was something that was a grassroots effort, not something that was mandated or dictated by the legislature, or indeed going back to the Medici method, um, when the, des the desire to have a convention center uh, came about, there was not at that point a conversation about whether or not art should be part of that. So the case studies I'd like to share with you today, a couple I think are going to be fairly well known to you. I'm going to discuss Richard Serra's piece that was part of a Federal Arts Commission uh, called Tilted Arc in New York City. And of course, the most famous one of all, uh, Maya Lin's uh, piece called The Wall, uh, which is part of the Vietnam Memorial in Washington. And then a more recent example, um, Dennis Oppenheim's Blue Shirt. And then finally, I'm going to end up with a piece of controversy in Nebraska, which was one of the very last uh, public art pieces that uh, I administered for the Nebraska Arts Council before moving into this position. Tilted Arc. If you Google Tilted Arc, uh, you will find page after page after page of uh, commentary about this particular piece and about uh, what happened to it and why. This was commissioned as part of the Art and Architectures Program for the uh, General Services Administration, the GSA. The federal government does have a public art uh, program. And as a matter of fact, there is a piece of public art across the street, and there are several in Omaha. There are now two uh, federal buildings in Omaha, and uh, each either has a piece that was commissioned through this program or will have shortly. This particular work uh, was selected by a committee uh, to be put in the what's called the Federal Plaza, which is uh, in Lower Manhattan. Richard Serra. Uh, an artist who, um, there's a piece on campus here, is a, a well-known, highly renowned sculptor, American sculptor. And uh, the 1981, when this piece was installed, certainly had um, that reputation as he does today. The committee for this kind of work usually consists of the bureaucrats from the federal government, um, some local arts experts, usually curators, um, uh, museum directors, um, critics on occasion, and uh, what we call the client. In other words, people that are going to inhabit the space where the art is going to be. My suspicion as we look back on this is that this committee was just so overwhelmed being not only a project that was in New York, but also a project that was really close to where a lot of blue chip artists live that uh, the range of possibilities for this was just overwhelming and I suspect it was very difficult for them to narrow down to something that they felt would enhance the space. And when Richard Serra made his um, talk when he was a finalist, he talked about the, the piece that you're seeing here which is uh, it's steel where it was steel. It's 12 feet high and it's roughly 120 feet long. It, it's uh, very consistent with the type of work he does where he works with large sheets of steel. 
What he said to the committee was, I'm viewing this entire plaza and I'm trying to make a reaction in a viewer's mind to what this plaza is all about. In other words, I'm going to put this steel curtain in and it's going to, because its material is very different, as you can see from the decorative uh, paving that is beneath it, or even the structures that are around it, I want the viewer to walk into this plaza and see the contrast between the work and the rest of the environment. And as they walk along the work, because remember it's tilted arc, it's, it's, it's uh, curved. So as you walk along the work, your viewpoint changes as you walk. Well, as I'm telling you this, it all sounds very reasonable. And indeed, um, if you were going to do an installation in a large gallery or in a more controlled environment, what an excellent idea. What the committee didn't count on, and the artist didn't either, although I'll read you in a second what the artist has to say about this idea, what the committee didn't count on when they uh, awarded him the commission, put the work up, was that what this piece did was block what the public viewed as their cow path between the federal building and the hot dog stand. Simple as that. The plaza was being constantly crisscrossed with pedestrians. And I challenge you to think about the last time you were in an environment where you were faced with uh, a plaza. What's your tendency? Do you walk along the perimeter? No. You go diagonal, do you not? Well, you can see what a problem this caused. And I think had this not blocked the cow path, that the other uh, slings and arrows that were thrown at it for a number of years, well, about it being ugly, about it attracting rats, <laughs> which I'm sure how that would happen, uh, graffiti actually being a place where they could throw bombs, and again, this is way before 9-11, we're talking here the early 80s. I think all of that could have been overcome. I think with uh, if it would have been in a place where people weren't irritated every time they went to get their hot dog at lunch, they might have started to view the contrast in steel with the rest of the plaza and all of those good things that this piece was meant to portray. Let me read to you what the artist says about the work when he initially put it up. The viewer becomes aware of himself and his movement through the plaza. As he moves, the sculpture changes. Contraction and expansion of the sculpture result from the viewer's movement. Step by step, the perception not only of the sculpture, but of the entire environment changes. As I mentioned, very logical thing to have. Well, once the controversy started, and believe me, it started pretty quickly after it was erected in 1981, by 1985 there was a public hearing about the piece. And at that time, the sculptor said, I don't think it's the function of art to be pleasing. Art is not democratic, and it's not for the people. Probably not, <laughs> probably not uh, a comment that is going to assuage uh, the anger of the uh, federal workers who worked in the plaza. But what's interesting, if you go back and look at the transcripts of the public hearings, 122 people came out in favor of this work and there were only 50 people that showed up to testify against the work. Now, one could argue that perhaps the average Joe, the average federal worker, felt that they would be intimidated to go in and know that they would be across the aisle uh, from the director of the Museum of Modern Art. That might have been part of it. But nevertheless, um, after all the testimony was heard, it was ruled that the piece should be removed. And indeed, the piece was removed, uh, interestingly, in the dead of night. In 1989, a uh, federal work crew came in, cut the piece in three, and hauled it off. 
Now that starts a whole other round of issues which has to do with artistic integrity. It has to do with the artist's role in this. Um, again, there's a federal ruling about this that says that, you know, the piece belongs to the federal government and therefore they can do with it what they like. And since then, there has been a lot of um, look, looking at federal legislation and state fed, uh, legislation in terms of what the artist's right is to a work of art, even though it is no longer under his or her jurisdiction. At the same time, the tilted arc was being erected. This was also being erected in Washington, D.C. And the process was just a little different. I mean, this was, in a sense, a federal project, but it didn't fall under the auspices of the Public Works Administration. So the, the manner in which it was selected was a little different. Uh, there was a site that was set aside uh, by the Park Service on the Mall in Washington for a memorial uh, from the Vietnam conflict. And again, a blue ribbon panel was selected to look at uh, all of the submissions to see just exactly what was there. And as you probably all know the story, a 21-year-old uh, Yale architecture student named Maya Lin submitted a proposal which basically suggested that a highly polished granite wall be placed, be sited, on a kind of a knoll, <clears throat> and I chose this picture so you've, if you've not been there, so that you understand that the back side of the wall is actually um, kind of the side of the cliff, as it were, the side of the hill, and that if you walk to the memorial from that side, you do not see it. In other words, you cannot see this piece unless you walk around to the side or you're coming from the other direction and you still have a gradual slope down. So it's really more than just a polished wall with names on it. It really is very site specific or it's a manipulation of this site that has to do with a, a variety of allusions to to war. Uh, you know, going and digging a trench, uh, digging a grave. All of those ideas are really part and parcel of what this is about. And I think in this case, uh, just like in the case with the Tilted Arc, the professionals on the panel immediately recognized what a significant change this would be and what the public viewed as memorial war sculpture. And as you leave today, I encourage you to look at the little exhibition that, as I understand, is coming down this afternoon. There are a number of panels that have to do with war memorials. And I can't stress to you enough how this work from 1981, even though it's very ubiquitous today, in 1981 radically changed how we view memorial sculpture for war. And a lot of the examples of, of previous memorials are out in the exhibition. And indeed, if you go through Nebraska, um, you'll find Civil War monuments in a number of cemeteries across the state. Uh, there's a particularly nice example of a, I think it's a three-war <laughs> or four-war um, memorial that is in Antelope Park. And that is what the public really thought of when they thought of, of memorial war sculpture. Well, as you know the story, uh, this, when the announcement of the commission uh, hit the press, immediate outcry. And um, it just kept on. And fortunately, the piece persevered and, and got built. The charge of this public outcry was led by uh, Illinois Representative Henry Hyde and um, the political pundit Pat Buchanan, and uh, just kept going at a fever pitch until finally uh, Ross Perot, the Texas businessman who would later then run for uh, the presidency, put up a, a kind of seed money to have another work erected, which is Frederick Hart's Three Servicemen statue. And note the date, 1984. So you see it was a very short period when you think that this had to be done a lot with uh, public donation. 
from the time that the Vietnam Wall was built and, and, and installed in 81 to 1984 is a relatively short period of time. As you all know, the irony of this is when you visit the site, the activity is at the wall. When you think about the memorial, you think of the wall. In a way, even though as you walk by this, and people do, and they comp it, contemplate it, but it's not what is in the public consciousness. This is not the work that is the one that people think of. And so that's why there was this sea change, because indeed, this is the traditional type of war memorial. And I think it's interesting that the whole site has even taken a, a, a further um, manifestation. Um, this was just about the time, you note the date on this is 1993. The debate of women in the military is really something that we talk about now, and certainly we're talking about in the early 90s. And so there was a movement afoot about, hey, wait a second, you know, there were women in the military in Vietnam. There were women that uh, did other functions uh, to support the w effort in Vietnam. They should be part of this too. And so another more traditional sculpture was erected in this Vietnam Memorial site uh, by Glenna Goodacre. And so, you know, you can say what you want about the two realistic bronzes versus the wall e stylistically, but what I find interesting about this is that the public has kind of embraced this entire site. And I think the desire to make it their own in a variety of ways is, is certainly an interesting aspect of this whole controversy. But what an interesting comparison. You have two works, Tilted Arc, the Vietnam Wall, both erected about the same time, both selected by blue ribbon panels, one ultimately extremely successful, one is no longer extant. What's the difference there? The difference is, I think with the Vietnam Memorial Committee, they really thought about the site. They thought about that people would want to visit it as an act of homage. And therefore, I think the thoughts about the sight lines, how one leads into the piece, how it's really more a destination, became foremost in their minds. Whereas with Tilted Arc, I think the committee got so focused on the commentary of the piece to the plaza the whole thought that the plaza was being used for other public functions really became very secondary. This is a maquette, and uh, maquettes are small um, pieces that sculptors use when uh, they visit a public art committee to show the committee what ultimately uh, their, their piece is going t to look like. And this maquette, and again, I apologize for it being a little fuzzy. It's by Dennis Oppenheim, um, a sculptor, and there's a Dennis Oppenheim major work in, in Lincoln, as a matter of fact, in, in a private collection. And um, this work was commissioned uh, for the Milwaukee Airport, the Mitchell Airport in Milwaukee. And uh, it was meant to enhance a parking garage, a multi-storied parking garage that was basically, as you can see behind it there, uh, just a big glass and steel box. And what uh, the sculptor proposed was a 34-foot high sculpture fabricated out of transparent um, acrylic, a plastic, that was in an aluminum frame that would be mounted on the side of the parking structure. And it's titled Blue Shirt. And, uh, you know, kind of an, I think, very interesting piece of, of um, if you want to use the term pop art, because this is not really like a lot of what else Dennis Oppenheim does, and I'll show you another example in a second. But nevertheless, I think it's a very interesting piece. If you're not familiar with the controversy, do you have any idea what the controversy was about on this and why this is, I'm showing you a maquette instead of the finished work? Milwaukee is a town that is blue collar, absolutely. And what happened in this case is that the good citizens of Milwaukee just didn't see themselves as blue collar any longer. 
they like to see themselves as progressive, as high tech, as all of those things that they, you know, they always look down the lake at Chicago. You know, they're always kind of like the, uh, the, the poor cousin of Chicago. And they really started coming into their own. They had a renovation of their museum, their art museum, a renovation of their uh, lakefront. Um, Milwaukee's kind of a happening place. And the notion that the sculptor would take them and drag them back to their blue collar roots really didn't sit well with the local press. And as you know, these things get really hyped up on talk radio and really became uh, the big issue. And so what happened in this piece, just like with um, Tilted Arc, the arts community has come to uh, its defense, and indeed the national arts community has come to its defense. But you have to remember that politicians, in this case, uh, because they're part of the committee or oversee the committee, run it. And the politicians in Milwaukee just simply didn't want to take a chance. They just really felt that they could not take the chance that, uh, number one, the public would just hate it. And number two, they weren't really sure, again, about this allusion to being a blue-collar town. Now, here's an example of what, when you think of Dennis Oppenheim's work, uh, what you normally see. Uh, this is a piece called Bus Home. What it is, as you can see, a bus transfer station uh, in a mall in Southern California. And these kind of flying, uh, flying house forms and uh, this kind of twisting energy or the dynamic energy of, of uh, uh, putting a building in a different relationship to the ground than what you would normally see is very much what he's doing these days. And of course this has become very much an icon for this particular mall. They've reported that uh, bus ridership is up quite a bit because people want to go and sit in this wonderful structure and wait for a bus. And of course, as you know, that's a pretty hard sell in Southern California. So one would look at the previous piece, the blue shirt, and say, okay, you know, it did well, Milwaukee make a mistake here? Here they had this, uh, this opportunity to take a piece that again could have become iconographic for the community. And are they missing a great opportunity? There's another, as there always is in these situations, the artist had been paid, I think it was uh, about a $250,000 project approximately, and he'd been paid roughly half of that to do the fabrications. And of course, they wanted their money back, and he said, sorry, can't do. So it's still in the court system. And uh, although the, uh, the word is, is that it will not be built, um, who knows? It may be built at some time. Finally, I'd like to talk about uh, a little controversy in Nebraska. This uh, is a little used courtyard uh, at the, on the campus of Wayne State College in uh, northeast Nebraska, Wayne, Nebraska. And uh, as I mentioned before, the state of Nebraska does have a public art law, and uh, any time there is a building that uh, state funds go into, you can uh, kick the law in. And in the case of Wayne State, they had done some renovation on their fine arts building and in a couple of other locations. And uh, they asked if they could uh, consolidate the funds uh, for one major piece. And I said, certainly. And they were also extremely interested in having an exterior piece because I think uh, they were interested in creating, uh, again, a, a more of an artistic environment on the campus. Most of the work they have uh, on that campus is interior, and I think uh, they have a few exterior pieces, but they wanted to enhance that. So when I worked with the committee, we looked around and we decided this was such an ugly space. As you can see, it's pavements that were produced at different times. Um, there really isn't a sense that this is a public walkway, and indeed it is a public walkway. Students do use it to uh, go diagonally, hence that idea of the cow path again. And uh, so we thought, well, let's put out the call for works that um, could enhance this space. And the work that we uh, commissioned 
was a piece by an artist, uh, Zoran, uh, he uses just his last name, uh, who's uh, Yugoslavian, Yugoslavian by birth, who lives now in Minneapolis and uh, does a number of public artworks in the Upper Midwest in particular. His proposal was to create the path and he wanted to haul in giant granite boulders to make this path and then he had noted as he drove from Minneapolis to uh, Wayne that northeast Nebraska is a tremendously lovely area of the states very green and hilly and so he proposed that on either side of these boulders he wanted to sculpt the grass into hillocks that would echo the hills of northeast Nebraska. Well, the committee just really liked the idea. They felt that this was the project that really met the needs of the space. And so he was commissioned to do the work. And um, it wasn't without a little bit of controversy by the committee, and I certainly um, can attest that the president of the university had to take a little convincing that uh, $35,000 was going to be expended on boulders. But little did I know, especially after attending the unveiling of the work and the artist came in and not only installed the piece, but also worked with the art students and had them help him put this all together. And there were a number of people at the unveiling, and uh, there was a lot of excitement on campus. It's become, as I've heard, a, a kind of a favorite place that people like to go, and they do like to walk through the canyon. It's called Wildcat Canyon. It has a, has a different title, but this is the title that the uh, students call it. So I thought, fine. Next thing I know, there is a bill in the legislature that uh, proposes to take Nebraska's 1% for art law from one percent to one half percent. So of course I started doing my research, found out that uh, the legislation was really proposed because of the coffee clutch circuit in northeast Nebraska when they found out thirty-five thousand dollars was expended on rocks. The shorthand is we're at the state's in a budget crisis. Remember this is installed in about 2002-2003. State's in a budget crisis. I'm reading in the paper that Wayne State College is being cut and cut drastically. How can they be spending this kind of money? Well, I think when you boil it down to those statements, you're right. I think everyone would be concerned. What the problem is, and this is often the problem with public art, is that the process, because it is so inclusive, and it does require committees and it does require working towards um, all sorts of, of legislative mandates and also funding streams that never was quite understood that the one percent for this piece was really extracted from a variety of completed projects building projects the money was there for the project and was to be expended on that project it really didn't have anything to do with the rest of the budget and so um, that became something that, that we uh, testified for. I will, I'm pleased to report that the uh, bill has not made its way out of committee. It's still kind of part of the pile of bills that uh, are there, but it hasn't made it out of committee. And I think the case I wanted to make was, you know, when you use state money, it really is dependent on what you have available. And if your economy is slim, you're not doing very much building, therefore there is no money to expend for, for public art. So uh, hopefully uh, this little controversy has died down for the moment, but even things like this that uh, are pretty small scale uh, can be controversial. And I always remind committees that it doesn't matter what you pick, it's always going to be controversial. I'd like to finish with just a, a look at this piece because this has come to my attention just recently and I, if some of you were listening to public radio a couple of days ago they, they profiled uh, this artist and this really seems to be a trend and indeed I was glad to see that the Letters Home installation um, is also part of the uh, pieces that you can look at the uh, storyboards outside the auditorium. There, there seems to be a movement afoot uh, that again goes right back to Maya Lin of taking words 
and doing memorials with words. And in this case, a German sculptor thought about the idea of all of the people that were um, lost during the Holocaust. And although there's lots of Holocaust memorials, as you know, and, and many of them extremely moving, being a German, he thought, well, you know, if I can find out where these people live, I I'd like to put something in, in front of where they lived. And so he's created, and there are thousands of them all over Germany, uh, little what he calls, and I am not going to try the German because it's very bad and I'll butcher it for all time, but the German transla it translates into English as stumbling block. And essentially what they are are little brass plaques that are raised ever so slightly from the sidewalk so that when you're walking along you literally come across a little brass plaque and on the brass plaque uh, the artist gives about as much information as he can put on the plaque and sometimes it's very brief and sometimes it's a little longer and let me read you just one of those it's not on any of these that you're seeing but it just gives you a sense of what it is Dr. Max Eichholz lived here period born 1881 period detention by Gestapo 1935 to 1942 period deported 1942 period murdered January 12th 1943 in Auschwitz period that's all it says but it's outside where the doctor lived the young gentleman you see there uh, is looking at a number of stumbling blocks and when there is a, a home where there were a number of people living each person gets their own brass plaque I'd like to close with this because I think it, it really sums up uh, the notion that that public art in all of its manifestations uh, is good for you, uh, but there are other things about it that, that can be problematic. And, and the first thing I thought of, and I thought, oh, Suzanne, you've been in this business way too long. But could we do this in, in Nebraska, for example? I don't know. For There were a couple of lynchings in Omaha. Wouldn't that be something if you had uh, a plaque in front of uh, the home or, or maybe the location of where that person lived and the first thing I thought of the city would never allow it they would never allow you to not have a smooth sidewalk so you know that that's my curse is that that's the sort of thing I think of rather than kind of be in the moment and, and think about the art and what it represents for all of you okay I've concluded um, if you have any questions I'd be happy to answer them For your real estate product, how do you go about finding artists? How do you do? You, do you know of certain artists that you contact, or is there a publication that you put a notice in? Um, how do you how do you find them? the question? Is how do you go about finding artists for a project? We all have databases of of artists that are interested in projects, and uh, now with the internet being so ubiquitous a lot of times projects are posted on the web and so artists know to go periodically to your website to see if there's a project you write up a call for proposals and say very specifically what it is you're looking for um, not the specifics of the work but but you really describe the site and what you hope to accomplish at that site send them out you get back the proposals the first step is that the committee reviews those and then usually narrows down to a few I always recommend that it, you have at least three people and bring all three people in to give a presentation to the committee and hopefully to a broader audience. Um, I think that give and take with an artist really helps one decide whether or not that's the appropriate work. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened in this case. Other questions? question is do I have a pe uh, favorite piece of, of public art in Nebraska <laughs> you know the one that when I, my gut feeling is and it really has to do with being a native of this state and and having it, it's all part of my consciousness and I go back to the state capitol and thinking of the state capitol in its in, in its entirety not just one component but its entirety to me is is an extraordinary work of art public art and uh, 
it's part of my consciousness. So I guess if I had to say, uh, that would be it. Do I have favorites of, like, say, from the Sheldon Sculpture Garden? Indeed, I do, but probably would not be, uh, I could go on and on. It's like asking someone's favorite color. It depends on what shade of that color. <laughs> Anything else? Yes? Do the uh, funds loosening up a little bit or are more enthusiasm about um, uh, broadening the idea of public art? around the state? The question was, is there any enthusiasm and movement towards broadening public art in the state, both financially and I think in terms of interest? You know, I'd have to let uh, some of the, the museums that work with public art or that work with their, their art collections address that issue in terms of their funding, but in terms of the state funds, um, those are going to remain flat until the economy gets on its feet again. As I had mentioned to the senators when I was uh, telling them that I didn't think the 1% to 1.5% was a good idea, you really don't have a percent for art unless you are actually building a building or renovating a building. So it really has to do with the economy. I think the fact that the Quest Center um, is actually now moving forward uh, with identifying art as something that's really important and necessary to me says at least there's a groundswell that recognizes that art is a very impart, important part of, of what you do as a, as a society and uh, so I'm very pleased to hear that. Now again the funding issue is, is a big bugaboo in that case but uh, certainly the desire is there in the community that uh, public art be part of this, this new addition to the Omaha skyline. Yes? Do you remember the controversy when the sculptors were placed at the rest stops on the interstate? The question is, do I remember the controversy of when the uh, sculptures were placed on the, uh, at the rest stops on the interstate? And indeed I do. Uh, I won't tell you how old I was. I, I'll tell you I was, I was pretty young. but. Um, you know, it's, it's really funny, and uh, those works uh, are not controlled by the Arts Council. They're actually controlled by the Department of Roads. And so they're, um, again, some of them are, are, they're all, I will say, lovingly maintained in the way in which that they can be maintained. Uh, but uh, they're certainly, um, they're cer certainly still all there, and we s I still get calls or emails from travelers who uh, want to know more about them. Again, funding issue, there's no funding available currently to have an updated brochure of the pieces, which is unfortunate because people still ask about them because it's one of the earliest kind of broad-based public art projects in the country. And going back to your question, I think what's interesting is the piece that created the most controversy was uh, John Ramonde's Irma's Desire. And as you view the work and view it within the context of all the other modern sculptures in Nebraska, it, it, it's pretty uh, bland. And I think that, that it really had to do more with the title. Almost like the, the Oppenheim, the blue, sh the blue shirt, the blue collar. It to, that was really what incensed people, was Irma's desire. It's like, my goodness, what could that mean? And I think you all know that Irma was the sculptor's uh, mother. So, you know, you, you, can never, you can never puzzle out what you need to out of an artist's title. But um, they're all kind of holding up well. But in, in today's context, which is um, decades after they were created, you know, they still uh, perform their function, but they certainly aren't nearly as radical as I think a lot of people at the time thought they would be and an embarrassment to the state. Uh, far from it. We, we still get uh, visitors, particularly from um, foreign countries, um, that want to know more about them. Yes? You're asking the wrong person on that. I think probably that would be a question to ask of uh, the Lincoln Arts Council, who works very closely with the city of Lincoln. And again, I suspect, um, without knowing the facts, that it's one of those situations where, again, it has to be a combination of um, 
desire to get it done and also funding. Funding plays a very major role. And then I'd like to just put that in the context a little bit. The very first work we looked at, The Tilted Ark by Richard Serra, 1980, uh, that cost about $125,000, which today is roughly a tenth of what it would cost to do the same thing. So I'm not suggesting that the city of Lincoln has to come up with millions of dollars to place art or even do temporary installations, but certainly you have to have some money available to, to do it and to do it right. Sure. About the Oppenheim piece. Was he actually trying to allude to the blue collar roots of Milwaukee? Or was that just is that just how it was interpreted by the citizens and the newspapers? The question was did Demons, Dennis Hoppen, Oppenheim really intend that it be a blue collar and allude to the city of Milwaukee? Most definitely. Um, there's another piece, famous piece in Cincinnati uh, by the sculptor uh, Andrew Lester that he did these columns with flying pigs on them. And the allusion to, because he'd read about the city of Cincinnati, and at one point it was called Porkopolis because of all the pork placking plants. Try that with the <laughs> microphone on. At any rate, way back in their history, but certainly it was part of Cincinnati's history, and that created a lot of controversy because Cincinnati would have just as soon people forgotten about the Porkopolis. And I think that's what's happened with Milwaukee. Okay. I think we're, we're adjourned. Well, thank you. Thank you.